City Council meeting. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using in response to Governor Brown's stay home, stay safe order. This format enables City Council to meet, hear from the community and take care of business while keeping its members, staff and the public safe. Following our first couple of items tonight, there will be a public forum followed by one action item to appoint members of the city's boards and commissions. There are several housekeeping announcements and instructions related to the meeting format that I need to take care of. Thank you for your patience. First, anyone wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by following the access instructions listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meet, me, meeting materials webpage. For those who join the meeting via computer, device, or phone, your microphone, webcam, and phone are automatically muted when you enter the meeting as an attendee. If you wish to participate during the public forum portion of the meeting and haven't already done so, please raise your virtual hand now to join the speaker's queue in one of the two ways. For those, for the, uh, for those, somebody is needs to be mute. Thank you. For those viewing the meeting on a computer, laptop, or other device, click once on the blue hand icon. For those listening to the meeting on a phone, press star nine. We will continue accepting raised hands until 735. The meeting monitor moderator will unraise or disallow any requests to speak that are made after the deadline. When the public forum begins, our meeting moderator will announce two speakers at a time. When it is your turn, the moderator will announce your name and unmute your microphone. You will have two minutes to speak. Finally, I want to thank everyone for your patience, flexibility, and good humor as we work through this virtual meeting format. As always, feel free to contact any one of us individually or together via email or voicemail if there is testimony you were not able to provide or wish to get to us in a different manner. And now as we open the meeting, uh, June 14th is flag day and council's operating agreements call for us to say the Pledge of Allegiance on four holidays a year, one of which is flag day and this is the closest meeting day to flag day. So we will begin with a Pledge of Allegiance and I just want to say that we are currently a city, a state, and a nation that is in the midst of three crises, our ongoing crisis of homelessness, the health and associated impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the historical and ongoing crisis of racial justice that has reached a tipping point since the killing of George Floyd. At this time, can be hard for people to feel deeply patriotic. But we, as a council, do the public's work in this form as a citizen-led government in a society that is built on the principles of justice and liberty for all. And we hold a public forum to encourage people to use their right to free speech. This moment of saying the Pledge of Allegiance is a commitment to those essential values of our society. So if you would, if you can stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, I guess I got to get back on the screen here. Okay, we have a first item in this meeting before we go into the public forum is committee reports and items of interest. I know that um, Councillor Clark has a report he wishes to make. I have two proclamations. So I, if it's all right with you, I'm going to begin with those proclamations and then I'll open it up to Councillor Clark and anybody else who has an item or a report. You can raise your hand. Yeah. All right. So the first don't part. Forget, don't forget, Mayor, I, I, I had my uh, nose in that tent. 
Yes, I know. I'm going to I'm going to do proxy okay. and turn it over to you. And then I see uh, Emily's on the queue. So and then the city manager has something. OK. The first proclamation uh, is related to National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Uh, whereas more than 100 Americans lose their lives to gun violence each day, and whereas protecting public safety in the communities they serve is the mayor's highest responsibility. In 2013, Hadia Pendleton, a 15-year-old teenager who marched in President Obama's second inaugural parade, was tragically shot and killed just weeks later. And the idea of honoring Hadia was inspired by a group of her friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. They chose this color because hunters wear orange to protect themselves while in the woods. Anyone can join the National Coalition of Organizations that has designated June 5th, the first Friday in June 2020, as Wear Orange Day. We renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous people and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, therefore, I, Lucy Vinnis, mayor of the city of Eugene, Oregon, do hereby proclaim Friday, June 5, 2020, as National Gun Violence Awareness Day. I encourage all citizens to support their local communities' efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. And in a second proclamation, honoring our region's high school students. Whereas Eugene area 2020 high school graduating class has experienced the heartbreaking interruption of their educational and social lives due to the COVID-19 health emergency. And this interruption has resulted in the cancellation or postponement of celebratory milestones that students <coughs> worked hard for and looked forward to participating in with their friends and family. The graduating seniors deserve to have their high school achievements be recognized by their community with pomp and circumstance. We encourage all residents to support graduating seniors in our community as they pursue higher education, housing, employment, and recreational activities. Now, therefore, I, Lucy Venice, mayor of the city of Eugene, Oregon, with grateful recognition of all they have accomplished this year and the years leading up to their graduation do hereby proclaim June 2020 as High School Senior Recognition Month in Eugene, Oregon to celebrate, support, and honor our local graduating seniors. Congratulations, all of you. I wish we were partying together to celebrate, but we do our best. Okay, and with that said, I turn this over to Councillor Evans, then Councillor Semple. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, on behalf of the uh, Black professional, the Eugene Black professionals, um, I would like to read uh, this 10 point uh, suggestion uh, for police reform here in Eugene. Uh, one, 12 hours of mandatory diversity training to be completed by all Eugene Police Department personnel. Training should be conducted by people of color in the local community. Police officers who have three formal complaints brought against them shall be reevaluated. Uh, stop giving police officers the preponderance of evidence. Three, police chief must control, must have control over the police department, not the police union. Four, police unions cannot threaten with delays and police responses, intentional responses that are delayed should be considered a crime because this endangers public safety. Five, demilitarize the police, weapons, gases, gear, combat training. Six, hold attorney, hold, hold the district attorney accountable for prosecuting police officers who violate the code of conduct and public trust. Seven, Every police officer should be given a yearly psychological evaluation. Eight, police need to be vetted more closely, especially when moving between departments. Nine, 
the police chief should schedule a mandated a mandated quarterly debriefing with the communities of color. And 10, we want an ongoing survey of traffic stops and crime statistics to include gender and race. And I'm putting this uh, forward to the public on behalf of the Black Professionals Association of Eugene um, and as of a meeting of this past Saturday. So um, those are those are the points that 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 we wanted to get across. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, uh, Councilor Evans, for your work on that and for presenting that to us. And now it's up to Councilor Semple and then Councilor Yeh. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a lot of energy. It's a lot of uh, people on edge on all sides right now. I'm really concerned about our camp closures. Uh, people are writing to us about the closure of the, the county campgrounds. Why did the city do this? Um, and I would like us to be very cautious about this and very slow. I know that we're thinking about the, the most um, unsafe and unsanitary places first, but I'm really concerned about the interactions between our, our vulnerable marginalized populations and our very, very tired police officers. I personally would like us just to take two weeks off before we start um, moving people along because it's such a fragile time and the energy is so high. Um, but at the very least, let's minimize the camp closures um, until more shelter is available. And let's provide a list of guidelines so people know which sorts of things they really need to pay attention to, such as um, the garbage and noise. I'd also like us to, to stop waking people up when they're asleep because they're not causing any trouble while they're sleeping and they might cause less trouble the next day if they got some sleep. So what if people weren't causing a health or a safety or on private property uh, between nine and seven, just do not disturb sign instead of wake up and move. But the, the biggest thing is we keep hearing with, with the virus and it's true here, we're not gonna solve this without all of us working together. And I don't mean just the city and the residents, which I do mean us because we can use our backyards and maybe we have extra lots, we, we can help. Um, the city could provide parking lots and parking structures, um, underdeveloped parks, undeveloped parks, we're not using the parking. People still aren't coming downtown. Phase two still says work at home. Um, the county emptied out the fairgrounds. You know, I, I get it, but at the same time, we're not having any events and that's a lot of parking lots and uneven building. Um, 4J, there's no school, parking lots, cafeterias, gyms, they have showers, bathrooms, you could cook food there. Um, LCC, Lane, they've got cafeterias and gyms. And uh, the U of O, they've got a lot. They're not having students. And guess what? There's no audience for those football games. That's a lot of parking lot. I want us, all of us, to come together, stop being so scared and wimpy about it, and get our uh, resources that we have out there available for people. Get some porta potties, let us wash our hands, and let us sleep. Don't wake us up. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Yeh. Yeah, first thank you, Emily, for what you just said. Um, and uh, Greg brought up a lot of great policy issues, so I wanted to make sure that people knew about another opportunity besides City Council to give feedback about police policy, and that would be the Police Commission, which is meeting this Thursday. So um, this Thursday, June 11th, 5 30 p.m. Obviously, we're doing it by Zoom and not at our normal location. But if you go to the Police Commission website um, on the City of Eugene website, there is a link to the meeting, and then we will be taking public comment. Um, so if you are interested in sharing specific ideas or general ideas about police policy, that is an excellent an opportunity for you to share it with the people that do review and make rec recommendations with our Eugene Police Department. Thank you. And the city manager has a comment. 
Hi, Mayor, thank you. I uh, sent an email earlier today, but just wanted to use this opportunity since I know it's hard to get to all the emails to uh, let everybody know that I did terminate the emergency declaration that was related to last weekend's activities and the emergency declaration for the COVID-19 emergency is set to expire tomorrow. And I'm planning to let that expire and not extend that as we interface to. Thank you very much. It is, I think that's a appropriate moves and we appreciate that. All right, any, if there's any, no other comments, we are ready to move on to the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to the city council on any city related issues, except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. Each person will have two minutes to speak. When it is your turn and your microphone has been unmuted, please state your name clearly and for Eugene residents, your ward if known before beginning your comments. If you are watching the meeting, the timer should be visible. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light and beep indicate the end of the two minutes. When your time has concluded, the moderator will mute your microphone and move on to the next speaker. For those who have connected to the meeting via phone and don't have the benefit of seeing the timer, please be aware that your microphone will be muted at the two minute mark. Um, Mayor? Yes. May I remind you the consent calendar? Did you wanna complete oh, that? Oh, I forgot. I skipped right over that. I'm so sorry. You're right. I forgot all about it. Um, can we just, yes. Let's just back up and take care of the consent calendar. I, pro I apologize. I move. I move to approve the items on the consent calendar. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you all very much. And Jessica, thanks for getting me back on track. Okay, that passes, thank you. And now we're back to the public forum. Um, uh, Jessica, do we have a lineup of speakers? We do, we have 32 folks signed up to speak this evening. Okay, that's great. So we might as well get it rolling then. Thank you so much. Sure. Our first speaker is Senator Manning, followed by Thomas Hura. Senator Manning, you're good to speak. Um, this happens to me. Am, am I here? Am I heard? Here, let me let me just get Wait, in here for a second. That sounds. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, this, that's is, not this is Manning. not Senator Manning. No, no, um, that's funny. It's happened to me before on Facebook. Um, but as long as I can, I'll continue now. Can you guys hear me at all? We just yes, we can. Who are okay. you? Who are you? We uh, need to know who you are, though. I'm James Cole Manning the third. I am from uh, <laughs> Eugene. I live, I'm not sure what ward I am. I'm that's off funny. Of West. Uh, yeah, it is funny. Um, I'm off West 11th, uh, right over there by Mark and uh, Albertsons. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say that I haven't seen anything in this town that makes me so terrified as I have the response of the police coming up on the first night uh, that we were uh, put under the order to stay home. Like the first night you didn't get an alert on your phone. The second night you did. I was just out for a walk. And what I saw were police out ready to crack heads. Anybody who was out was getting stared down. I wasn't doing anything. I was just walking around. I didn't know that we were told to stay home because of the events that were going on. Um, I want you to protect me from the police because I have no confidence in them anymore. Uh, I'm actually scared that they're just gonna pull me over, put up some charges, figure out, maybe they just don't like me. Who knows what it is, but there's a couple of things that I would like to see, and I'm not sure if these things are already in use, okay? One thing is, is I, I would like to see that body cams, it should be illegal to turn those off. It should be considered tampering with evidence to turn off a body cam, and also the data from body cams should go to the independent police auditor or another body so that the police themselves don't have access to it. Now, if that is something I'm unaware of that is already happening, I'm sorry. Um, but I just couldn't believe the response of the police. 
I, I'm so flabbergasted by it. I don't even know what to say. Uh, bringing out an armored tank to just shoot chemical weapons at people. Um, I watched a bunch of kids just get shot tear gas and it looked like that's what the cops were waiting for. So uh, please protect me from the police. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Tira, followed by Claire Haley. Go ahead, Tom. Hello, I'm also not Senator Manning. Can you hear me? Um, Thomas Huda, they, them, Ward 1. I have a message to the City Council and a message to the Mayor. To the Council, thank you for your steadfast efforts. We've got to get down to some politically daunting but ultimately straightforward work. We've listened to the courageous and clear voices of Black and BIPOC leaders, as well as their many white allies. I submit to you that on the 11th day in a row of demonstrations, most of which have been youth-led, it's past time to act for the future of Eugene. Eugene Police has $68 million in the budget. The unarmed crisis workers of Cahoots have $2 million. You may have seen in the New York Times that cities like Minneapolis are looking to Cahoots as a model. It's time to give them funding that is congruent with their success and reputation. To the mayor, thank you for your efforts. At the beginning of this meeting, you called this moment a tipping point for racial justice. I would strongly urge you to walk back your statements in your June 3rd video update. In these rare times when police brutality is given real attention, you gave untempered praise for a police force that had just beforehand gassed and beamed a Eugene Weekly journalist who performed his job legally. Being silent about that misconduct was one thing, but you even went as far as to demonize the very diverse protesters who choose to demonstrate in the evening. After I've been going, peacefully demonstrating after dark. We've been lying down on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds. It's not comfortable. You haven't been there. So it was very hurtful to hear um, that you said that those, that people who are demonstrating in the evening were uh, showing no concern for the safety of others. I think that we act out of in intense concern and with urgency for the moment. So I, I, I urge you to consider these thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next speaker is Claire Haley, followed by Henry Louvert. Hello, my name is Claire Haley and I'm a resident of Ward 3. I'd like to speak today about the Eugene Police Department. About a month ago, I was walking my dog outside my apartment. I saw a car screech to a halt and a white man jumped out. He began threatening and shouting at another white man passing by on the street, and it was clear that the situation was about to turn into a full-blown fight. I ran inside my apartment, my apartment, grabbed my phone, and dialed 911. In this situation, I didn't hesitate to call the police because both men involved were white. However, if either of them had been people of color, I would not have dialed 911. I would not have trusted that asking heavily armed, potentially racist police to respond would have been safer than the fight that was about to happen outside of my apartment. The job of the police is public safety, but for an entire segment of the population, the police represent a greater danger than the things they claim to protect them from. The city's proposed budget for 2021 allocates $68 million for policing, and over half of that is specifically designated for police patrols. The EPD plans on adding 10 patrol officers next year with this funding. The police department is the largest recipient of general fund dollars in the city's proposed budget. But who is all of this policing for? Who is all of this money going to benefit? If the public doesn't trust the police to respond to situations involving people of color, then at its best, policing is a public service that only benefits white people. At its worst, it is an institution that actively harms and kills people of color. I urge you to reprioritize the city's budget by divesting in policing and investing instead in public safety programs like CAHOOTS that can serve all members of this community. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Henry Louvert, followed by Tim Kovash. Henry, you're good to speak. He's still Henry. muted, Jessica. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. I'm uh, Henry Levert from Ward 1. And I, I keep hearing the echo, I'm sorry. But what I want to talk about is police and police training or the lack thereof. Most of the training that the police department has is on how to either kill, maim, detain, or and not to communicate. And the communities of color, we need to be able to communicate or have the police officers be able to communicate with us. I've been here over 40 years and I've asked several police chiefs when I was uh, president of the NAACP that we need to have a dialogue with the police officers, a, a structured communication uh, dialogue with the police department. And he said, well, he didn't think they would go for that. And the thing is, if you don't go for that, what do you go for if we never get a chance for the officers to find out who we are and what we're about in the community? It's very important to tear down a lot of the cultural barriers and the stereotypes. Most of these, uh, or a lot of the Eugene police, they come from areas where there may not be a lot of people of color. And all they have to know about us is the stereotypes that have been taught. What we like to do is change that. If you don't want what happened in Minnesota to happen here, we need to be able to know we can communicate. And you need to know that you got officers who didn't transfer here from another department who has a whole list of problems that they brought with them. Now, as far as I know, Communication is going to be the first step. Then maybe we can learn to trust the police department and the police department will learn to trust and understand us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Kovash, followed by Hallie. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. My name is Tim Kovash, Eugene resident from Ward 3. Thank you for both your time and service to the city and community. In the midst of multiple crises ongoing, apologies to bring this up tonight, but we did not set up the timetable and only have a limited time to present our opinion. We previously spoke with each council member earlier this year about the research we did on the local STR market and discussed the positive benefits of a registration. This process would provide needed information to the council, such as how many STRs are in the city limits, how many of them are owner occupied, and also a local contact for any problems that might arise. City staff also referenced a simple registration during ad hoc committee meeting number three. In the newly proposed draft ordinance, city staff has added a quarterly registry to the now license, which would require hosts to submit unneeded information such as how many guests were in the group and how many nights they stayed. This will involve increased staff processing time, which the STR hosts will then have to pay for in an increased license fee. This is an unduly burdensome process to the host. The registry was mentioned only once during the last meeting of the ad hoc committee process by a hotel lobbyist. The hotel lobbyist suggested that the city collect the extra information which is only relevant to the hotel industry. It does not solve any problems or issues for the city of Eugene. There are also several privacy issues of concerning nature with the proposed registry. Many counselors seem to want to keep the process simple and inexpensive, particularly important in the time of extreme economic stress on, local many, on many local businesses, including ours. We propose adding STRs to the city rental office that oversees long-term rentals. Long-term rental owners pay $10 per year per rental, and also the office provides a contact point for neighbors to file a complaint. We should not need to reinvent a new city bureaucracy financed by struggling hosts for a simple process that already exists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hallie, followed by Thiessen Freed. Allie, you're good to speak. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes. Allie yes, Roberts, former campaign manager of Star Voting. I would like to remind you with your upcoming decision this Wednesday um, as to whether to refer Star Voting to the ballot for the city of Eugene elections process that in the last election, when we were able to get star voting on the ballot for Lane County elections, over 70% of Eugenians voted yes for star voting. That is a clear mandate that the city of Eugene wants star voting. Um, I would love to see it on the ballot and I would love to believe that that is one way to create real change in Eugene. It's by getting a system that elects representative officials. Um, and with that, I will switch my comments at this time to um, speak on the current issues with Black Lives Matter and um, police brutality in our nation and in our city. I signed a petition today to reallocate funds for the Eugene Police Department um, away from the armed forces that we call the Eugene Police Department to reallocate those to our non-armed, non-violent crisis intervention team, which we call CAHOOTS. CAHOOTS is a nationally recognized organization that has created a new model for crisis intervention, a model which is being looked at nationally. The city of Minneapolis is considering and apparently has a veto-proof majority to disband the city police and replace it with institutions like CAHOOTS. I think Eugene should defund the city police by 30% as this petition is asking and reallocate to CAHOOTS non-armed forces for Eugene. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thiessen Freed followed by Megan Faulkner. I can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Thiessen Freed. I live in Ward 3. Um, I want to say that the changes of, in use of force policy offered by Police Chief Skinner are downright pathetic. Any reforms or policy changes that depend on trusting the police to change their rules and tactics are worthless. The Eugene Police Department has proven over this last week a brutal treatment of peaceful protesters that they cannot be trusted to follow the laws they supposedly enforce. We must begin work immediately to deal with the epidemic of police brutality and power. This begins by fulfilling the demands laid out by the Civil Liberties Defense Center in their open letter to city officials, including an immediate end to the use of tear gas, pepper spray, and other chemical weapons, the use of which are considered war crimes in international law, an immediate end to the use of projectiles falsely labeled non-lethal, like rubber bullets, bean bags, and flash grenades, immediately dropping all charges against all protesters, confiscation of all military surplus equipment from the Eugene Police Department, and confiscation of all firearms and ammunition in possession of the EPD. I also demand that the City Council vote to commit to defunding and phasing out the Eugene Police Department, just like the Minneapolis City Council did this week, and moving the vast amount of funds that go into this active terrorizing force in our community towards things like cahoots and a new community-led public safety and emergency programs. Chief Skinner said that trust and legitimacy are the primary pillars of effective policy, uh, policing. I, like a, a, like a majority of Eugene citizens, do not trust the Eugene Police Department and do not recognize them as a legitimate institution in our city. Something must be done immediately. And whether or not this necessitates us electing a new mayor and new city council who are actually interested in keeping our community safe is entirely up to you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Megan Faulkner, followed by Holly Johannes. Okay, is everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Megan Faulkner, resident of Ward 3. I want to speak today to those of you who hear the cries for defunding police and immediately bristle. <clears throat> those who say, not all cops, and I know good cops. I say, so do I. I know plenty of them. I grew up surrounded by law enforcement. My dad was a police officer. My dad loves animals, gardening, and throwing burgers on the barbecue on a Saturday afternoon. He raised two young women, myself and my sister, to be self-sufficient, critical thinkers, 
fiercely loyal to our families and friends. He's a good man. I will also say that none of that matters. His intentions don't matter. His good deeds don't matter. Because I also know that the vast majority of his patrols were filled with running license plate numbers through dispatch, waiting for some minor crime to come up. He lurked outside of bars until closing time to hit the siren on anyone that had the audacity to get into a car at 2 a.m. He followed anybody who wasn't white, waiting for them to drive too fast, too slow, take a turn a little too sharply. He and his fellow officers rushed to the scene of any arrest, taking any form of opposition as an invitation for aggression. I share all this to make it clear that the entire policing system is violent, racist, and dehumanizing to its core. It's not one bad apple. It's not an isolated incident. These tactics weren't cruel inventions to fill a slow day. They were actively taught and endorsed during his training by the police chief and fellow officers. And this wasn't just his particular police department. You only have to look out your window, open a newspaper, or turn on the television to see the same tactics and much, much worse employed every day. I say all of this to call attention to the myth of the good cop. Police Chief Skinner may himself be a good cop. His officers may be good cops, but that means nothing within a system rooted in and upheld by institutional racism. The system cannot be reformed. I call for the Eugene City Council to defund the police and divert funding towards public health and safety infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Holly Johannes, followed by R. Will. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. My name is Holly Johannes, and I'm a resident of Ward 7. I'm speaking tonight to, in part, denounce the City of Eugene's analysis of the Eugene Police Department's policies as they relate to the Eight Can't Wait campaign. I strongly disagree that EPD has met six of the eight criteria and argue that currently the EPD's use of force policy contains only three, duty to intervene, use of force continuum, and banning of chokeholds and strangleholds. It is my opinion that whomever conducted the analysis for the city of Eugene is not familiar with the details of the Eight Can't Wait initiative, and erroneously stating that EPD meets six of those criteria makes it seem like the city is fraudulently, fraudulently checking a box to placate the public rather than committing to ending police brutality in Eugene. That policy review should be removed from the city of Eugene website. I conducted a detailed analysis of the EPD's current policies as compared to those of the Eight Can't Wait initiative and emailed it to you on June 5th. I was planning to make specific requests tonight for policy changes. However, after listening further to local and national black leaders, I do not have faith that policy change will translate to a change in violent police behavior. Police brutality, particularly as inflicted against black people, is a centuries old problem. Current video exposure of the violence inflicted by police departments across the country, many of whom already have the eight can't wait policies in place, prove proves once again that policy change does not translate to the cessation of police brutality. Therefore, as citizens and city leaders, we need to commit to defunding and dismantling the police. I want to emphasize that divesting in the police force and their increased militarization does not equate to divesting in public safety, as Chief Skinner insinuated in his press conference on June 5th. Instead of investing in the police, the city of Eugene should invest in more community resources, such as mental health services, services for the unhoused, public health care, non-carceral interven non intervention programs, and an expansion of the CAHOOTS program. I want my community to feel and be safe, and that means for all people, not just some. Police are causing harm, and we need to stop giving them the funding to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Christina Lang, followed by Valerie Harris. Hello, I'm Christina Lang, Ward 2. I'm, again, also, this seems inappropriate to even talk about because of all the turmoil that's happening right now, but I guess we are still um, going to have to deal with short term, the short term rental ordinance. So um, I'm a short term rental host and um, I was surprised to see that the new draft ordinance requires licensing rather than registration. Um, there are only three other types of businesses that need a business license in Eugene. It's payday lenders, uh, taxi companies and tobacco sales or retail sales. Um, hotels and home-based businesses whom the short-term rental hosts have been compared to don't require a business license. Um, my neighbor with a counseling business uh, rents it out of her house, doesn't need one. The adult care home across the street um, is a non-owner-occupied 
residents, they don't need a, a license. Um, so, uh, and sorry, I lost my. I know that there's been talk about requiring a license so that people can't list their house on Airbnb without having a valid license number. Um, but in the um, ordinance, the draft ordinance, it doesn't specify, you know, who has to uh, be, have a license. So what about someone who uh, is just renting their house out for a week during the Olympic trials? Um, or someone who, you know, wants, needs to, or rents their house out for a couple of weeks if they're on vacation or something like that? Do they have to have a license? Um, I think that we um, are, it's an expensive proposition and we should just use what we already have. We already have a long-term rental program that short-term rentals could register with. And we already um, have short-term rentals registered with the finance department for um, collecting TRTs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Valerie Harris, followed by Catherine Dunn. Valerie, are you ready to speak? Valerie, are you with us? Okay, let's move on to our next speaker, Catherine Dunn. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. Okay, Valerie just spoke and I couldn't hear my name, but anyway, I'm Catherine Dunn, Ward 5. Again, based on these current events, I wish I didn't have to talk about short-term rentals tonight, but we do since it doesn't seem that the city wants to postpone this issue. The terms registration and licensing were intermingled during the ad hoc committees and also the council meetings. And there was no discussion about the differences between these terms. Licensing is more involved, a big production. And um, I do not believe that it's warranted at this time. Even Dinatali noted in her report, which we're all familiar with that registration may be less of an administrative burden on cities. So why consider stringent licensing when short-term rentals have not been shown to be a problem? Why go through the rigmarole? Also, why should short-term rentals be licensed when home-based businesses and long-term rentals are not licensed? For very similar, if not the same. A basic registration is all that is needed and we can use the same process as Eugene's long-term rentals have as Valerie just mentioned. And we also have a registration process per, currently in place for short-term rentals. We're just not exercising that. The city is not. If you call that office, they have even heard that they say, well, we don't need to do that anymore because um, uh, Airbnb is collecting the taxes. Well, you might want to check into that. It seems the city manager's ordinance not only calls for licensing, but it also calls for the continuance of the registration process. Why can't we just do the registration process at this time and see how that goes? Registration um, and licensing especially are unduly burdensome because they shift the entire burden for short-term rental restrictions to individuals in our community who have short-term rentals. And not only that, the city is asking short-term rental hosts to pay for the cost to implement these costly licensing programs. Why should STR hosts pay the entire cost of implementing something when the city has not provided data that a real problem exists and it benefits the city, not the short-term rentals? I think the council should implement registration only at this time and the city could implement licensing if it were needed to protect public health, safety and welfare, but STRs and Eugene have not been shown to be affecting public health, safety or welfare. Thank you. Thank you. Valerie, can you let me know if you have already given your testimony? I have not. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Ah, you can hear me this time. Great. All right. Valerie Harris, Ward 5. Uh, as indicated by all my fellow speakers tonight, there are so many important and pressing pro problems for the council to work on, and I really appreciate their efforts. But as I listened to the last short-term rental working session, the lengthy discussions made it clear that we still do not have data to support that there is a problem. 
In fact, in the middle of a meeting, when Councillor Clark asked the city manager what the problem the council is trying to solve, she could not answer the question and referred it back to the councillor. I want to let that sink in. The city manager who was putting together an ordinance did not know what the problem was that we were trying to solve, even after over a year of discussions, an ad hoc committee, and multiple working sessions. Based on the lack of knowledge on the problem, the counselors then each spoke about what they felt was the problem. And again, let me let that sink in. What they felt was the problem. It was all supposition. My summary of the five opinions brought up on short-term rental problems was, first, the high cost of living in the city, of which we have no data to support that short-term rentals impact this problem, not knowing your neighbors and rolly bags in the neighborhood. What, what is the size of this problem and is it a problem? nuisances such as noise, garbage, and parking. And I want to point out that then this one, the city manager stated that she has not seen an increase in the data on nuisance complaints since the increase on short-term rentals over the years. And then finally, the inability to enforce compliance with the current laws, such as the nuisance laws. But if we can't enforce our nuisance laws, that is a problem with enforcement of our laws, not short-term rentals. So the conclusion that we needed is more information and that's great, good discussion, let's get that information. But the ordinance drafted is for a license which not only gathers information but also begins regulating without knowing if we need to add regulation. All you need for the next steps are the name and addresses of the owners, that's it. And then you can gather data on complaints. Please keep it simple and focus on what we can do, need to do, solve problem. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joshua Korn, followed by Reggie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, Joshua Korn, Ward 2, and I, I'd like to speak on 5G wireless technology and give an update on that. Um, and while I uh, want to acknowledge all these other topics of, of great importance that come up throughout these council meetings, I, I, I'd also like to emphasize that we as opposition to 5G wireless technology have been one of the most consistently um, reporting the, uh, the issues here. And I'd really like to hear um, some response from from the city council and mayor here about, about this important issue, because what I'm seeing from my research is that number one, the residential implementation of 5G, all of the installations that are being put up throughout our district are all illegal installations and if these applications are scrutinized we have plenty of avenues for stopping them uh, that is when there are in residential neighborhoods because the laws on this is are very strict if they're over the um, threshold of effective radiated power and 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 other factors as well including uh, gaps in coverage so there's plenty of avenues to, um, to contest this. And I would like to uh, offer my assistance in engaging with the planning department and um, to help with the process because I'm seeing more and more of these towers pop up in residential neighborhoods and putting our residents at risk. And I have talked a lot about the risk factors. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Reggie, followed by Silky Booker. Hello, I'm speak. I live. My name is Reggie Haley, and I live in Ward One. I'm speaking to you all to say I'm absolutely disappointed in the leadership I have seen in the city and its dedication to impeding progress. As many of us in this community marched and remembered the name of George Floyd and all others lost to police terror and white supremacy. We witnessed the city manager and the police cooperate to silence protests and create a state of fear with ridiculous curfews as police seemingly eager to use their toys cause physical harm to youth and a journalist and terror and fear to others. 
And then this last Friday, we see the city in the middle of an ongoing pandemic taking away what pathetically little emergency shelter this city did provide. To put it simple, the decade I have lived in Eugene, I have seen allegedly progressive leaders talk in circles about the conditions that create t misery, toil, and terror that shape many of our lives with no progress. Just fancy dinners where the rich think the rich and what few programs do go into effect lack funding or material support to create real solutions, vanish and vanish. Now, am I to believe the leadership of the city is anything but charlatans when all we see is favors to those who control capital under the rebranding of local business as those who bear the violence and brunt oppression are left to die? If we are to believe in any of the words of the city and its claim to care for progressive ideals, we need to start seeing action. This looks like immediate decriminalization of poverty. Poverty. This looks like defunding EPD. This looks like the resignation of Chief Skinner and the resignation of Sarah Metery. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is Soki Booker, followed by Brooklyn Wetzel. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Soki J. Booker. I've only been in Eugene for about three years now. I'm a local radio show host uh, and philanthropist. Uh, I want to first thank the mayor, the city council, uh, especially Councilman Evans for bringing forth the uh, changes that need to transpire in order to stop this police brutality and harassment in the, within the communities of color. Um, I'm retired military uh, since I deployed four times since I've been back uh, stateside. I have been harassed by the police. Um, I've also uh, been had my life threatened uh, to be killed at my place of work. Um, and from what I from what I gather from being here is that I don't feel safe or protected by the police. Um, there's been plenty of issues that have been brought to your attention. I really feel like a change must happen in order for the people of color our community to matter. So a change is in order, it must happen. And the best teacher is experience. And I can teach you as, long as, as, as well as many other people in the community of color through our experience if you listen and act. Uh, you, as I look at this council, you have the opportunity to make history in Eugene to protect the communities of color. You have to act now, there's enough talking um, there's been plenty of debate back and forth. You know in your heart what's right and what's wrong. You know that, you know if you feel protected at night. You know what you don't have to worry about walking out of your front door every day. I have frights and fears that you will never ever have to fear and face. So I need you to act, historically act for this city and the people of color in this city. Time for talking is over. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Councilman Evans, for being a pillar for the Black community. And thank you, Councilman, for hearing me and acting. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brooklyn Wetzel, followed by Nikolai St Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hello, City Council. My name is Brooklyn Wetzel, and I live in Ward 1. I was brought to tears of joy on Sunday by the news the Minneapolis City Council majority is voting to disband the police and totally rethink public safety. There's a long road ahead, but police abolition that has a long history is real and relevant right now, and it's time to pay attention. I understand this could be new and scary concepts, and I want to make sure you hear this. These are the five essential findings of the MPD 150, a community coalition working for this inspirational change. The police were established to protect the interests of the wealthy and racialized violence has always been a part of that mission. The police cannot be reformed away from their core function. The police criminalized dark skin and poverty, channeling millions of people into the prison system, depriving them of voting and employment rights, and thereby preserving privileged access to housing, jobs, land, credit, and education for whites. The police militarize and escalate situations that call for social service intervention. There are viable existing and potential alternatives to policing for every area in which the police engage. Abolition is not a light switch, but a commitment to a new way of thinking and doing things. Here are five, four real ideas from the abolition movement for you to consider, and people have said other ones. F suspend paid administrative leave. Withhold pensions and do not rehire cops that use excessive force. Require cops to be personally liable for misconduct. Taxpayers should not be covering police misconduct settlements. Most of all, prioritize spending on community programs. 
make a plan to move our money away from the 68 million in militant policing and into community programs. This is a human rights movement and it's going to demand you do more than talk and create band-aids of reform. Abolitionist ideas are real and will lead us away from policing as we know it and into a beautiful and safe future for all citizens. I as future I support and will work towards and I hope you will join me. Learn more about it at mpd150.com and criticalresistance.org, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole, sorry, Serbin, followed by Chelsea Swift. Nicolae, are you ready to speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I would like to uh, call on the city to um, to move funding away from the Eugene Police Department and reallocate it to CAHOOTS and to the White Bird Clinic. Uh, they respond to 20% of the calls placed to the Eugene Police Department, and I believe that their funding should reflect their work. Uh, currently, they, I believe, are receiving roughly $2 million a year to respond to the, to the city's needs in a way that is uh, trained and professional, which cannot be said of the Eugene Police Department. The Eugene Police Department does not receive any kind uh, of the amount of training that is necessary uh, to deal with people who are in crisis, especially people of color. And... Uh, this is evidenced by the recent killing of Brian Babb, who was called, uh, the police were called for a wellness check to check up on him, and he was killed. Now, the uh, independent auditor took issue with some of the particulars around that case, but it was ultimately ruled that everything was fine. And that, that is a, a miscarriage of justice, and it's one that is quite common here in Eugene with the EPD being taken at face value for words that are lies. Um, recently at the protests, um, I was organizing a protest, a peaceful protest in front of the fire department on Willamette and 13th. A Eugene police department officer approached us and told us that we were uh, inside the curfew zone, which was wrong. Now, whether he meant that as a lie or because he was wrong, it doesn't matter. He wasn't prepared to deal with real issues in the way that Cahoots can, and I ask you to fund them instead of the Eugene Police Department. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chelsea Swift, followed by Cliff Gray. Hi, my name is Chelsea Swift. I'm from Ward 1. I'm a crisis worker and EMT on Cahoots. I'm here representing my own views and experience, though. The other day, George Floyd was lynched by police. The other day, somebody committed suicide in Springfield Municipal Jail by hanging themselves. The other day, Police Chief Skinner changed our agency policy and Eugene Police Department of when exactly they will strangle people in the field, accepting that they will continue to strangle people in the field as young people chant in the streets, I can't breathe. The other day a bear cat was parked a block away from my house and I had to think of my friend Josh who was killed by Oakland police in 2018 on a welfare check that a job like mine would have responded to. He was unconscious when he was shot with several rounds by four militarized officers hiding behind a bear cat. The other day, someone came up to me when I was working and asked if I could call the city manager's office to tell them that he had to wait two hours at the bottle drop recycling center because so many people are depending on our trash as their income in this city. The other day, the city and county closed their emergency shelters despite promises of hope and possible different outcomes in this council. The other day, the Eugene city manager finally decriminalized shelter in place for people who are living on the streets, but it was only when she created a curfew to enable unbelievable and unwarranted state violence. The other day, EPD tear gassed a journalist and arrested youth who were walking home. The other day, someone came up to me crying because he did not understand why his camp had been posted to be swept when he thought the city wasn't doing that. 
But today, today I found out that the person who at some point we will all say we were fighting for, the person whose name we demand abolition in, George Floyd, I need you to know that at the time of his death, George Floyd worked at a homeless shelter. Thank you. Next speaker is Cliff Gray, followed by login name Aboriginal A. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to first uh, congratulate the, the opening statements of both uh, Emily Semple and Greg Evans. Uh, I support both of your concepts wholeheartedly. I have two issues to bring up. One is that you haven't seemed to be listening into your work session. You haven't been sensitive to the upcoming uh, explosion and homeless that we will experience once the moratorium ends. Um, I, even as we speak, there's the numerous notices going out of intent to evict, intent to raise rents, 10% in the case of my friend Martha Bryston. Um, and you are, of course, not recording these 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 figures as, as Lucy and I discuss one time. And you need to do that uh, to predict what's going to happen. It's going to be a huge disaster nationwide. It's going to be about forty to forty-five percent, but conditions here make it look a lot worse than that. The rents are way too high in comparison to other other states. So the other issue is uh, pointed to Greg. Thank you for saying all that. I like that uh, program that you set up. I, I hope you will all accept it. I will add this point. In an a era of COVID, we have to do something about banning uh, tear gas and, and other agents, pepper spray uh, and a pepper shot, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, because they endanger the pulmonary system and make it and make uh, you know the ability to to be infected with uh, COVID that much more intense. So please, please ban those things because you know I can just imagine the lawsuits we'll get you know when you get those people infected by both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is login name Aboriginal A, followed by login name Star Voting Team. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, my name is Elijah Smith. Uh, I'm a Eugene resident. Uh, first off, I just want to give my respect and uh, thank you guys for your hard work so far. But I do have a message to the council. Um, I respect the police, but I think it's time that we need to face reality um, and that's our reality with race relations. I have a couple points that I need to make. First, I believe that we need to defund the police and reallocate into healthcare and funds for the, uh, for the unhoused, just like all the previous speakers have said. I also believe that some of those funds need to be allocated into education. That alone would decrease poverty and crime because what is the one reason why people, cre um, why people commit crime? Poverty. And I agree with the 10 points that um, our speaker from the BPA, I said, sorry. I agree with the 10 points that our, the speaker with our BPA, I said, and I also have another point. I believe that students must learn the real history or else what happened in the last two weeks will happen again and again and again and again. Until we come into um, reality with our, past, um, with our past race relations, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over myself. There's no way that people are gonna come together. There's just no possible way. I also noticed that there's something on the ballot that's going to be, um, sorry, I yield my time. I, I yield my time. I'm sorry. Thank you. The next speaker is login name Star Voting Team, followed by Lynn Woodrich. Hi, can you hear me? I can. This is Sarah Wolk from Ward 1 um, speaking to star voting. And I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Evans and everyone who's spoken to the issue of police accountability, systemic racism, and public safety. And second, the, the many asks made. 
In these times, we need bold leadership from Eugene City Council to help realize a vision that can be that we can be proud of and that the rest of the country can look to as a model. Oregon was the first to implement the ballot initiative system itself. We used preferential voting in some Oregon cities over 100 years ago, and Oregon is the model that is constantly pointed to for election reform nationally, for good reason. So I'm here to speak to the upcoming work session on star voting this Wednesday. Star voting for Eugene petition turned in almost 30% over the required number of signatures required to qualify for the ballot. And that's almost doubled the recommended buffer. Following the rejection of a number of those signatures for fully subjective reasons, the petition was deemed void, falling short by only 111, which is a difference of only 23 signatures in the sample size that was actually looked at. Our campaign did an extensive review and found 32 signatures that had been clearly rejected in error for a variety of minor issues. Correcting these simple errors would reverse the ruling and qualify our petition for the ballot. Additionally, our campaign collected 31 signed and notarized affidavits for voters whose signatures were rejected and who were able to review and confirm that they had in fact signed and that the signature on the page was theirs. The ballot initiative process is one of the most fundamental and Oregonian examples of government of, by, and for the people. And city council, you're our only remaining mechanism for appeal. As you may know, we submitted a legal appeal as well in addition, um, but like our work session that has been delayed due to COVID-19 and won't take place in time to get our initiative on the 2020 November ballot. Our final update is that star voting this year has been recently used successfully in a number of major and official elections. The Independent Party of Oregon used star voting for their May primary for all statewide offices, which was a resounding success. Multnomah County Democratic Party now uses star voting for all internal elections, most recently electing state central committee delegates. And the Democratic Party of Oregon working with the DNC is now currently using star voting for Oregon's presidential delegate elections. If you adopt this, you won't be first. Star voting is being proposed and adopted by forward thinking organizations around the country because it goes so much further than the current binary choose one only system. Star voting offers more equitable representation and better election accuracy anytime there are more than two candidates in the race. It frees voters to vote their conscience and delivers better accountability for voters. It's compatible you know, with Sarah, integrity Sarah, practices. Thank you, Sarah. You're really at time. Sure. I just, I'm actually in my last sentence. But thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Lynn Woodrich, followed by Shayla Duke. Okay. Uh, my name is Lynn Woodrich. I'm the active Bethel Citizens co-chair living in Ward 6 with my 91-year-old dad, and I'm a homeowner in the Bethel portion of Ward 8. I'm speaking as a resident and co-captain of Burnson Road Neighborhood Watch. I spoke to you before when the homeless shelters were being constructed without any warning. I wasn't happy about that. It is literally in my backyard. I would now like to say that my Burnson Road neighbors want you to know that the homeless shelters were well managed and we haven't had any problems at all. We want only the best for these people. If you can keep them together, that would be wonderful. They have created a community and I understand there are residents who could be given a job to be the manager of the group. Please do what you can to help these people stay together. The White Bird and Carry It Forward groups did excellent vetting for these groups. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Shayla Duke, followed by a caller with a number ending in 327. Thank you. My name is Shayla Duke. I am in the, uh, I live in the Bethel area and um, I was on the ad hoc committee. I voted against the registration um, uh, proposal um, because there was not enough uh, or any for that matter data to support the need for a registration. Um, and in addition to the fact that there already is a registration uh, policy already in place. And um, I was pretty um, 
shocked and offended and I felt pretty railroaded by the city staff uh, in regards to their decision to, um, I don't know if it was their decision or if it was the council's decision or wh whoever's decision it was, but to move forward with the, uh, the registration, and which has now turned into a license uh, issue, um, a licensing process, and then also a, a fee, because um, there was never any discussion on um, the details of that. And um, I just wanted to uh, put that out there, and I don't feel like it was appropriate to um, um, move forward with that, especially in light of the pandemic, um, because um, I feel like the, the pandemic is kind of being used as a, uh, um, a stepping stone um, or a, uh, you know, an out for them to, for this policy to be able to put, be pushed forward, and I feel like that's an inappropriate, and I would like to um, request that you um, um, reinstate the ad hoc committee and maybe also add some people from the community who, uh, who are allegedly being affected, um, such as people from the homeless uh, population who might have some good input. Um, and uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Thank you. The next speaker is a caller on the phone with a number ending in 327, followed by Charlotte Foote. Great. Uh, this is William Smith, also known as Rowan. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Calling from Ward 1 about wireless safety. And first off, I just want to say to city councilors, mayor, city manager, and staff that I've interacted with, uh, that my experience of you both on my issue and on many issues I've, I've been hearing at these forums, my experience has been that you really do care and that you're doing your very best to respond on many issues and needs where there are no easy answers. And, uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you. And then uh, also thank you, Josh, for uh, you, what you said earlier, I, I second what you said and also offer my assistance to city staff or anyone on this call to uh, pursue pathways of either contesting uh, the wireless transmission facilities that are um, apparently illegal. And I also would like to uh, point out that there are uh, at least a half dozen federal cases that have been moving in the direction of pushing back on the FCC and the telecom industry on safety and other related issues. So uh, we have there, we have um, there are much larger forces in play where, that, that can support this effort at the, at the city level. And so I want you all to know that as well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller is Charlotte Foote, followed by Matthew Yook. Hello. We can hear you. Hi. Um, my name is Katie Clark. I'm using my friend's computer. I'm a district of Ward 3. I'm a member of Ward 3. Um, I just wanted to make two things clear. First, I think it's becoming exceedingly apparent that reformism is reaching its expiration date in the sense that people are becoming tired and the normal political process we've been using is not becoming effective. Secondly, I think it's also becoming clear that the community is trying to protect each other from the police. And we're starting to do that effectively now by looking out for one another and starting to utilize programs that do not use state sanctioned violence and military force. And I also wanted to prop up the policy of being proposed that we demilitarize Eugene PD. And I think that one thing we should take into consideration is some of the policies that are necessitated by Eugene specifically are predicated off of criminalization of problems that people have that are not their fault. Um, 
what I mean by this is homelessness, as well as mental health issues, as well as drug using. I think that the money we currently allocate into punitive action being carried out by police forces should be reallocated into rehabilitative programs, whether that looks like healthcare that's more comprehensive and accessible, or into affordable housing that is giving people the protection they deserve as human beings. So I just wanted to say at the end of the day, I think that us as a city and as a county should be developing around vision in which we emphasize caring for our community and continuing to demilitarize it with an emphasis on making sure that we're not policing one another, but rather looking out for one another. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew Yook, followed by Mark Fromer. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yes, we can. Sweet, sorry about that. Um, hi, uh, my name's Matthew Yook, and I'm a resident of Ward 4. There have been a lot of powerful messages tonight, I feel, surrounding the response that the city of Eugene and Eugene Police Department have had to the recent demonstrations. I feel that the city of Eugene and EPD's actions on Sunday, May 29th, were barbaric. EPD says it wasn't shooting a reporter, violating the Geneva Convention, or accountability to their community that made them stop their violent militaristic response. It was national pressure. The continued abuses of EPD on our community, on nonviolent offenders and peaceful demonstrators, is part of a long history of police brutality. Eugene does not need to keep investing in police that laugh when they shoot a reporter. We need to devote resources towards nonviolent crisis intervention, de escalation, peacekeeping, and community health efforts. The lead up to the shooting of folks on their lawns and subsequent apology were nasty too. Extending the citywide curfew with a three minute warning so they could open fire on peaceful Eugenians then apologize for shooting a reporter by saying he was embedded like it's a war zone and not their fault for indiscriminately opening up on the public. The cops were literally crawling through the streets in armored vehicles, shooting anyone they saw, even those who just stepped outside to make sure everything was okay because it sounded like EPD was going to war with Eugenians. You, our city council, needs to hold the police accountable. This is not how they should protect and serve, and you need to present the facts on what happened Friday, May 27th. Thank you for espousing some more of that, Mayor Venice. There's fear from the rhetoric, from the rhetoric used. That lack of communication has not calling out of EPD's misdeeds as well, and emergency curfew alerts removed from your website, which were the only city pages with information about it, created a situation that has folks talking about a whole strip mall set on fire. This is building up resentment and folks not afraid to bring guns and run over and shoot at protesters. I Thank understand. You. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Fronmeyer, followed by Sarah Astra. Mute. Mark. Uh-huh. I, I hit. I gotta hit the unmute button. Got it. We Good evening. Uh, I, I'm Mark Fronmeyer, Ward Seven. I'm the founder of the Equal Vote Coalition. Our our mission is to bring equality into the voting method itself by allowing voters to cast votes with equal weight, free from the spoiler effect of vote splitting and the urge to so-called lesser evil vote against your favorite in order to prevent your least favored choice from winning. I'm calling in tonight to strongly suggest you place the star voting question before the voters, principally because a sufficient number of Eugene's voters put pen to petition in order to place this measure before the voters. And when some were rejected by the county, uh, they affirmed with notarized affidavits that they had indeed signed. The signature validation process is to prevent fraud, not to disenfranchise Eugene's voters, and you are the adjudicators of last resort. That being said, one concern that has been previously voiced is that STAR had not yet been used in a public election, so how can we use it in a public election? Well, no more. As Sarah Wolk mentioned, STAR had its first statewide public use in the Independent Party primary, and it was a huge success for the system. Voters were expressive. A strong majority scored more than one candidate in at least one of three races. The system was accurate. In the presidential preference poll, the finalists had scorings that almost exactly equaled their public approval ratings, despite a heavily lopsided field, and voters got it. 
Uh, while we had dozens of questions about the credentialing process and the online interface, there were zero, zero questions about the STAR method itself and the zero to five ballot. This is the right time for true equality in the franchise. I ask you to please put the question to the voters. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Astra, followed by Henry Lubert. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Astra, some background. I live in Ward 4. I hold a degree in criminology and I work full time doing crisis intervention in Lane County. Real quick, we should utilize star voting and I disagree with the decisions to close facilities for the unhoused, including one serving 50 youth. But what I feel is more pressing, I'm calling on the Eugene City Council to acknowledge the legacy of racism and white supremacy in Eugene from its founding to today. I'm calling on you to acknowledge and act on the ongoing ties between systemic racism and the institution of policing. Police protect capital and they serve whiteness and wealth. And further, I call on the Eugene City Council to follow the recommendations of the Civil Liberties Defense Center, including but not limited to confiscating chemical weapons like tear gas, projectiles like rubber bullets, military surplus equipment, firearms and ammunition from Eugene police. Also, I. Uh, call on you to follow their recommendations of putting a moratorium on curfews and dropping charges against any protesters. I call on you to defund EPD and allocate more resources for CAHOOTS, accessible housing and healthcare, education, and other community programs that acknowledge the inequity in our community. Thank you for your time. Black Lives Matter. I yield my time. Thank you. We have one more speaker signed up, but it may be a duplicate. So let us check on that now. Henry Louvert, are you there? He did already speak. Yes, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't another member of his household that wished to speak. Right, perfect. I could speak again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lubert. You call my name. That's it. We just wanted to make sure it was the same person that, that had already spoken, and it is. So thank you. And that concludes the public forum. That is everyone that signed up before the 735 deadline. That is excellent. Thank you very much. Well orchestrated. Are there counselors who wish to comment on any comments that you heard in that public forum? I'm looking for virtual or real raised hands? No? Okay. Thank you very much. And so I believe at this point, I turn this over to Council President Simple. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's time for us to vote on appointments to boards, commissions, and committees. First up, the Budget Committee. I move to reappoint Eliza Kaczynski to the Budget Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Uh, any discussion? Vote. Evans and Clark. Evans, Clark. Okay, looks like eight, eight to zero. Thank you, Greg, Councillor Evans. Um, Forgive me, Emily, you didn't ask yays and nays. Mine was oh, a Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Um, so am I supposed to say how many yays? Yes. Oh, oh I count up eight yays, right? And no. Then... All right, counted... why don't you give me a little demo because I'm confused. Yeah. How many in okay. favor is the question. The mayor yeah, should do Council this, though. Again, no, yes. the mayor doesn't do this. I apologize. You didn't ask for the nays. He wants to vote nay. Oh, okay. I thought I had counted eight. Are there any nays? One. Thank you. It, she passes seven to one with Councillor Clark voting nay. I move to reappoint Catherine Ryan to the Budget Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. 
I see eight. All against, say nay. Okay. Eight zero, Catherine Ryan is appointed. I'm, I move to appoint Raina Jackson to the Budget Committee for a three year term beginning July 1st, 2020, and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? Claire, I mean, Councillor Syret. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a note, and I'll do this on, a, um, I think, on the Police Commission as well. I chose to vote uh, in this case to appoint Ian Winbrock, who is in Ward 7 and uh, a member of the Whitaker Community Council, who I had a chance to meet with. And so I do support Brianna Jackson's application, but I felt an obligation to support my uh, ward uh, appointee there. So I just wanted to call that out. Thanks. So are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. Or raise your hand. For example. Or raise your hand, you know, I'll take either one. I count eight raised hands. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. All right, congratulations, Raina Jackson. You're approved, eight zero. Civilian Review Board, I move to reappoint Carolyn Williams to the Civilian Review Board for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Carolyn Williams. 8-0 to the Civilian Review Board. I move to appoint William Whalen to the Civilian Review Board for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Thank you. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, William Whalen. You have been appointed to the Civilian Review Board 8-0. I move to appoint Jose Cortez to the Civilian Review Board for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? Councillor Syret. Yeah, so a uh, similar situation. There was a uh, an application from Margaret Steinbrunn, um, who's a member of my ward and also a nearby neighbor. And um, so I supported her application to this board, but um, I will vote for Jose Cortez. Thank you. Anybody else? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Thank you. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations to Jose Cortez. You are appointed to the Civilian Review Board 8-0. Human Rights Commission. I move to reappoint Ibrahim Kulabe to the Human Rights Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Thank you. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Ibrahim Kulabe Bali. You have been um, reappointed to the Human Rights Commission 8-0. I move to reappoint Ibrahim Hamid to the Human Rights Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Ibrahim Hamid. You have been reappointed to the Human Rights Commission 8-0. I move to appoint Heather Selecki to the Human Rights Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 
Um, thank you. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Eight zero. Congratulations, Heather Selecki. You have been appointed to the Human Rights Commission. Planning Commission. Move to appoint Daniel Isaacson to the Planning Commission for a four year term beginning July 1, 2020, and ending on June 30, 2024. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations to Daniel Isaacson. You have been appointed to the Planning Commission. Eight zero. Police Commission. Mayor, did you have anything to say about this? Yes, thank you. I um, would like to suggest to the council that um, even though I passed these uh, nominations forward, they were voted on by the uh, by the Planning Commission subcommittee. They're all excellent candidates, but I think in light of current events and the need to um, have a little more time to reach out to candidates that come from the communities of color. I would suggest that council delay a vote and reopen this and see if some new applicants step forward. It, um, we had, we didn't have any diversity in this candidate pool this time and just opening the possibility that if you delay uh, a month, you might uh, attract some new more, some candidates who've been kind of mobilized by this event. So that is up to you, um, but that's my proposal. Do we need a motion? Councillor Syrett. Um, well, I just want to point out that Savario Mogar is a member of LULAC. Yeah, it, that's, so there's it's not true, zero but, diversity. Not, not, no, but in the new, in new, in new applicants. He's an, ex, he's he's an, an existing, existing new, commissioner. He's, he's a reappointment. He's an existing commissioner. There are no new applicants to increase the diversity there. Um, well, How about a compromise of reappointing the current commissioners that were um, selected here and then opening the three vacancies up for reappointment for more applications? Is that a motion? So yes. moved. Second. Second. Any, dis any discussion? Seeing none. Everyone in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Everyone opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Councillor Taylor, motion passes seven to one to reappoint uh, Silverio Mogart and William Davey, or do we need to take separate votes on each of them? Yeah, I think no. my motion was a, just a procedural thing. So I think we still need to vote on the specific. Vote on. We'll vote on the two reappointees and then do we vote to see whether or not to open? No, I believe that's what you just No, you just passed. did that. Thank you. I'm ready to go home. Oh, I am home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I move to reappoint Silverio Mogart to the police commission for a four-year term beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2024. Thank you. Discussion, Councillor Syrett, then Councillor Zelenka, then- No. Oh, you're voting. No, you're supposed to discuss. <laughs> okay, no discussion. Everyone in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Silverio Mogart. You have been reappointed to the Police Commission 8-0. I move to reappoint William Davey to the Police Commission for a four-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2024. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, William Davey. You have been reappointed to the Police Commission 8-0. So then we'll, we've opened it for more. Everybody get out there, fill in your applications. 
You could be deciding things about the police. Historic Review Board. A move to reappoint David Edrington to the Historic Review Board for a four-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2024. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, David Edrington. You have been reappointed to the Historic Review Board 8-0. I move to appoint Tiffany Vander Zanden to the Historic Review Board for a four-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2024. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Tiffany Vander Zanden. You have been appointed to the Historic Review Board 8-0. I move to appoint Leslie Yates Pollard to the Historic Review Board for a one-year unexpired term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2021. Discussion? Second. Oh, I want to get ahead. <laughs> Second, any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Leslie Yates Pollard. You have been appointed to the Historic Review Board, eight zero. I need water. <laughs> Lane Regional Air Protection Agency. I move to reappoint Janine Parisi to the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Janine Parisi, you have been reappointed to El Rapa 8-0. I move to appoint Howard Saxion to the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Howard Saxian. You have been appointed to the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency 80. Willamut Citizen Planning Committee, I move to reappoint. I didn't say that right, did I? It's close. Okay. I move to reappoint Vicki Mello to the Willamut, or close to that, Citizen Planning Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations to Vicki Mello. You have been Reappointed to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee for a three-year term, 8-0. I move to appoint Nicholas Gombart to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, Nicholas Gombart. You have been appointed to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee, 8-0. I move to appoint David Sonnichen to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations, David Sonichsen. You have been appointed to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee 8-0. And last one, move to appoint Sam 
I'm not going to be able to say this. I apologize, Sam. Sam Strowich to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2020 and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All opposed, raise your hand or say nay. Congratulations to Sam Stork. You have been appointed to the Willamette Citizen Planning Committee 80. Thank you everyone for all your discussion and voting. Congratulations to all of our successful candidates. I look here forward to hearing from you for the next one, two, three, or four years. Thanks. Thank you so much, Councillor Semple, for orchestrating that good voting and that with that is our final piece of business. So we are adjourned. Have a good evening, everyone. Yep.